uh, we welcome you all. Yeah, so everybody heard that. So this meeting, uh, this seminar will be recorded. Um, so uh, if you miss part of the event, you can come back and we will usually post this online uh, so you can visit it later. But uh, nothing beats having a real-time interaction with our speakers. So we uh, suggest that you stay online. So our session today runs from 8 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. It's at around nighttime in Boston. But I know a lot of you are attending from Taiwan or other sides of the world. And that will be from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Um, Taiwan time. So uh, today we're immensely fortunate to have two wonderful experts from the field to join us today to share their research, um, Dr. Chen Jiayan and Dr. Li Wanping. Uh, Dr. Chen will be our first speaker and he will give you an exciting talk on the latest advances of human genetics, researching cognitive function and its link with various brain disorders and the implications of these findings for development of therapeutic interventions. Uh, their next speaker, Dr. Li, uh, Li Wanping, will um, follow up with her presentation on introduction to the Alzheimer's disease sequencing project. It's called ADSP, a genetic initiative aimed at unraveling the genetic underpinnings of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, and how whole genome sequencing data assists in identifying these types of genomic variants and facilitating associate analysis and uh, new neurodegenerative diseases. So both talks will be around 35 minutes. And the best, uh, in a both talks, we'll have like a QS session ranging from like 10 to 20 minutes. Um, so please reserve all your questions until after both speakers have concluded their um, presentations. So the QA will be after both talks have finished. Um, so, and as a moderator, you can um, ask questions in the chat or you can also raise your hand and also uh, turn on your video camera and ask the questions um, the speakers them yourself. Um, so both options are okay. You can ask me to help you ask the question or uh, the speakers themselves can um, answer your question. So um, please note that uh, this seminar will be recorded for future reference. Um, and then uh, we will and then upload this video in case you missed it uh, to online for uh, you to uh, further uh, revisit in the future. So, uh, to start off, I'd like to uh, first introduce our first speaker, Dr. Chen Jiayan. Uh, he's the uh, Associate Director in Computational Biology and Genomics at Baogen. He's been at Baogen for like five years now, and his research is centered around using human genetics to enhance drug development for psychiatric and neurological diseases. Uh, his academic journey includes a Doctor of Science, his uh, actually more president of Doctor of uh, Philosophy in Genetic Epidemiology, also has a master's in biostatistics from Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. He's also contributed significantly to the field through the work of Psychiatric and Neurodevelopmental Genetics Unit and Mass General Hospital and the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard. Uh, he also worked on leading projects in biobank research, uh, genomic data linked to electronic health records, and extensive genetic association studies. So um, take it away, Dr. Chen. Um, I will give you a background on Dr. Lee after uh, Dr. Chen's talk. All right, thank you for your very kind introduction. So let me share my screen and... Uh... Wonderful. Turn off the closed caption. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Chayan Chen. So, and I'm really happy to be here today and have the chance to share with you uh, my research and a little bit related to what I do at Biogen and uh, how do we use uh, human genetics as an approach to understand cognitive function and as an approach for drug development. So, uh, in today's uh, presentation, I have three parts to talk about human genetics. Uh, from the beginning, I'll go through a little bit background on how do we use human genetics in drug development. And in the second and in the, in the third part, I'm going to talk about how do we use human genetics in drug development specifically for better understanding of cognitive function and through different approaches, including GWAS and post-GWAS analysis and exon sequencing study. 
So um, the results that I'm going to present in this uh, uh, here today uh, are all published. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to later look into the publications. And uh, I'm also happy to take any questions afterwards. But uh, without further ado, let me go into the first part. So the first part is that you may be wondering uh, what uh, a human geneticist is like me are doing in a pharmaceutical company, because eventually what our goal is to develop a new drug. So here I'm showing a very standard uh, drug development pipeline. We go from exploratory research to preclinical studies, to clinical development, to FDA uh, review and to post-market monitoring. So today I'm going to focus on the first part, the very beginning of the drug development pipeline that uh, we do, where we do exploratory research and especially on target identification and validation. That's where we use the human genetics uh, in drug development the most. And of course, uh, also in parallel, there's a lot of application for human genetics in clinical development, especially for position medicine that you can think of, for patient stratification, for clinical trial design. Uh, those, those, uh, those parts also use a lot of human genetics research in there. But today I'm going to focus on the target identification and validation. So very broadly at high level, what do we do uh, when we try to apply human genetics in target uh, identification and validation? We do genetic association studies um, to identify genes that's associated with specific diseases that we're trying to make a drug for. And uh, we try to go beyond that to go from genetic associations and link that to the function of the genes. So that's where we start to leverage the genetic association with RNA, with gene expression level, with protein level, with biomarkers. So that's where we use the QTL data uh, in our analysis. And going beyond that with specific statistical uh, approaches, we can establish the directionality and the magnitude of a gene's uh, effect or the perturbation or how do, when we perturb a, a gene's uh, function, how does that affect the downstream uh, disease risk or progression or severity? So. Uh, there, the example is Mendelian randomization is an analytical approach uh, that uh, people may uh, heard a lot about in the recent in recent years. And finally, we can uh, explore potential safety concerns or indication expansions using biobank data by performing uh, phenol-wide association studies. So these are all uh, all kinds of. Uh, analysis that we do based on human genetics data that uh, we try to support the exploratory research part of the drug development pipeline. So this is very high level, uh, but what we're trying to do with the human genetics data is really that if we imagine that we're trying to develop a, a, we're trying to develop a drug, the drug is actually that we want to see the drug's effect on certain biological functions. So we're going from uh, the left-hand side from the target modulation. So if we have a drug, we want to see if we apply the drug uh, to human, whether that changes certain biological functions that's in the middle panel that we hope to see there's a relationship, <coughs> a better a dose dependent relationship between uh, the drug dosage and the biological function functional change. And downstream of that functional change will eventually see the clinical outcome. So this is very high level conceptually that what we're trying to do when we try to develop a drug. But similarly, if we look at genetic data, what we can do is that if we say, if we try to investigate the naturally occur uh, genetic variations or mutations in human population, we can then see that, that we can see that as a kind of perturbation of the gene. And we can see that kind of perturbation, how does that affect the biological function downstream? And then further downstream, what's the clinical outcome of that? So instead of actually going into test out the drug, we can actually leverage the human genetic data and uh, to mimic the same similar pathway that going from 
a gene, a gene target to biological function to the clinical outcome. The advantage of that, of using human genetics data is that because in the past, maybe 10, 20 years, there's a lot of human genetics data resources already built up. So we can leverage these data resources that I'll talk about more later to quickly uh, go through this process to see from a perturbation of gene all the way to the clinical outcome, just based on analytical approach. So that gives us a very fast way to test out a certain hypothesis. So we call it fast to fail. That's actually a very important and a very desirable feature when we try to do drug development. We want to see if a target does not work, we want fast to fail so that we can uh, refocus on other promising targets. So that's how we, at a high level, how we use uh, human genetics for drug development. And of course, this approach has been um, as part of uh, a member in the pharmaceutical uh, industry. We always try to uh, prove that our, our value as a human geneticist in the industry. And here are two papers published back in 2015 and again uh, in 2022. We don't need to go into the details, but if you're interested in that, take a look. It's basically trying to um, show you some evidence that uh, the drug targets that's supported by human genetic evidence actually showed higher success rate uh, throughout the development uh, pipeline. And uh, as a matter of fact, I know there's a paper that's going to come out next week, I think, in Nature, talking about the same uh, topic again, but with newer data. So look out for that. So just very high level, why we're doing human genetics in drug development. But here we're going into more uh, details, talking about data and the methodology here. So the human genetics approach for target ID and for target validation. And I'll go from concept to method and then to a, a real data example focusing on cognitive function. So we talk about human genetics, we're not just looking at uh, germline DNA variations. We're trying to link that through different layers of biological uh, systems. So we want to go from genome to transcriptome to proteome to metabolome to uh, clinical phenotype. And the idea is that we want to use genetics as an anchor to link different layers of uh, biology that we can measure with the current technology and use that to build basically a network to link from gene to the intermediate phenotypes or biological functions to the clinical uh, outcome. And the way we actually, the way we do that is that we leverage the data and use uh, several different approaches. We start off with uh, genome-wide association study, GWAS. I think uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with the idea. And here I'm showing a result from one GWAS and this GWAS uh, is for adult cognitive function. Uh, this paper is published a couple of years back. So what you're looking at right here is that uh, we're measuring the strength of association or uh, the p-value for each genetic variation across the entire genome uh, in relation to adult cognitive function. So you can see that this is very typical for a complex polygenic trait in human population. So we can imagine cognitive function is a complex trait, which means that there can be so many genes that's involved uh, into uh, the difference of the cognitive function in, in human population. And that's reflected in the fact that we see so many genes and so many genetic variants that's uh, significantly associated uh, with cognitive function. And by significant, I mean that if we look at there's a red dotted line, and that's our threshold for our hypothesis testing. So any dot that goes beyond or higher than that line shows a significant statistical test result for that specific genetic variant and uh, associated with cognitive function. So this is the first step we want to have and know, uh, understand uh, which genes, which genetic variations are associated with the phenotype that we're interested in. 
And in this case, this is cognitive function. And uh, we can go beyond that. Uh, we can leverage the genetic association between, uh, with, between the genetic variations and the disease outcome. And on top of that, we can take genetic variations uh, associate that with intermediate phenotypes, such as gene expression, uh, protein levels, metabolite levels, biomarker levels. So here we can leverage these two types of data and use a statistical approach called Mendelian randomization to figure out the relationship between the intermediate phenotype and the clinical outcome. So the very high level idea is that we use genetic variation as the anchoring point. So we first measure the association between the genetic variation and the clinical outcome so that we know how the genetic variation is associated with the clinical outcome that we're interested in investigating. And then we perform a separate independent study to look at the genetic association between the, between the genetic variations and um, the in intermediate phenotypes. So for example, if we're interested in uh, evaluating gene expression, then we try to estimate the association between genetic variations and gene expression. So with these two pieces of information, the genetic association between, uh, with the genetic association with disease outcome and the genetic association with, for example, gene expression, we can use Mendelian randomization approach to estimate the effect of gene expression, whether it's going up or down, how does that affect the risk of disease? And in other cases, if we have genetic association between uh, the variations and disease progression or disease severity or drug response in the patients, we can in turn estimate the effect of these these uh, intermediate phenotypes on the relevant clinical outcomes. So that's one way we leverage the, ge the genetic data to estimate the effect of the gene, the, the effect of the functional change of the gene to the clinical outcome. So that's one way we do it. And uh, I want to also briefly mention that the approach of doing this, of using this statistical approach the advantage is that um, if we if we uh, try to do actual experiments uh, tr and uh, trying to get at how does say for example gene expression affect uh, the clinical outcome, we will need to have actually the individual level data uh, to be able to uh, estimate or understand uh, how does gene expression related to uh, the clinical outcome. But with the Mendelian randomization approach, we don't actually have to do the experiments. As long as we have the uh, genetic data or the GWAS for the gene expression and for the clinical outcome, then we can uh, perform this kind of uh, uh, analysis. So, which in other words, it's a much faster approach of course, subject to uh, statistical uh, uncertainties or the quality of the data or the availability of the data. But if the data is available, this is a much faster approach than trying to go uh, through the same process with uh, experiments. Another approach we use very often is called colocalization. Uh, the conceptual model is on the left. So basically what we're trying to do is that we want to see if certain genetic association signal are uh, happens at the same location across the genome. So for example, uh, on the left panel, the upper panel shows a GWAS that is showing whether a genetic association is associated, a, a, sorry, to show a genetic association for a disease phenotype. And on the lower panel is showing the genetic association with the gene expression. So in this case, what we can see that it happens that the genetic association for the disease uh, happens at the exact same location for uh, the genetic association for gene expression. 
which give us some hint. I mean, just intuitively, we can say that the gene expression seems to be related to the disease because otherwise uh, it'll be too much of a coincidence that we see a genetic association for the disease happens at exactly the same location for a genetic association with the gene expression, which build up the evidence that the genes function, at least at the expression level, uh, is related to the disease risk in this case. And uh, of course, we dig deeper into different types of data. So on the right panel, what we can see that we can do this type of colocalization using tissue specific uh, gene expression um, QTLs so that we can see if the colocalization happens specifically for gene expression in a specific tissue and in relation to the disease risk. And we can do similar analysis using other types of QTLs. Say for example, there are uh, brain uh, protein QTLs, there are plasma protein QTLs or protein QTLs in other tissue types. So if those data are available, we can also perform similar type of analysis to uh, build up the evidence of the co-localization of the functional uh, change in relation to the genetic variation and the disease risk or other features of the clinical outcome in relation to the genetic variation. So this is uh, another approach we use to sort of validate our uh, gene target that we identified using human genetic data. And finally, uh, this is a third approach that being used very often. So I won't go into uh, the details of uh, how to perform a transcriptome-wide association study. But what you can imagine is that if we look at the upper panel here uh, with the reference panel, the idea of a transcript transcriptome-wide association study or TWAS is that um, we can pre-build prediction models for gene expression. You, uh, the prediction is based on genetic variations and we can pre-build pre this kind of prediction model using reference panel. So basically using a data set like GTAG where uh, genetic variation data and gene expression data across different tissues are both available. We can build a prediction model that we can predict the gene expression level using genetic uh, variation data. And once the model is built, we can apply the uh, model to uh, any data that we have only the genotype or the genetic data, but not the gene expression data. So we apply the model to the genetic data and we can derive a predicted uh, gene expression level based on the genetic data. So in this, with this approach, we can actually uh, uh, skip the step that to actually measure the gene expression, but we can get predicted expression level based on genetic data only. And this approach uh, has been extended to uh, be able to just leverage the summary data. Uh, by summary data, I mean, uh, you can, if you have a result for from a GWAS, uh, you can apply this type of approach just to the result of GWAS. Uh, you don't even need the individual level genetic data uh, to be able to do this kind of prediction. And from this, we can then uh, infer the relationship between uh, gene expression and the specific uh, disease outcome or clinical outcome where we have genetic data or genetic association for. So this is another approach that we use very often. And you can see, uh, for the four approaches that I just introduced, we're trying to build up the relationship between genetic variation and disease or clinical outcome and genetic uh, variation and its relationship between gene expression or any intermediate biological phenotypes or molecular phenotypes. And a lot of these approaches are trying to put these data together so that we can leverage uh, the already exist human genetics data resources. Uh, for our analysis.
So here's a real example. Uh, the paper is published a couple of years back. The here in this paper, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to identify gene targets for nootropic drug repurposing. So nootropic it may be a more of a strange word that you never heard about, but nootropic drug basically means uh, IQ enhancer or cognitive function enhancer. So here we're actually looking for gene targets that uh, is suitable for drug repurposing uh, to repurpose the drug for enhancing cognitive function. And uh, in the figure you can see here, this is basically the analytical approach that we're going through. So it looks like uh, there's a lot going on through the process. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit in depth uh, in a minute, but you can see one key point here is that this entire analysis does not involve any data at individual level. So we're leveraging all existing published uh, GWAS data or uh, QTL data sets uh, to perform our analysis. Uh, I think the key to that is first, this is fast. And second, this is very cost effective because we're leveraging um, basically freely available uh, data sets out there. So what did we do exactly? The first part is that we go through the GWAS of cognitive function and try to run a whole bunch of additional analysis to identify the genes uh, from the GWAS and try to characterize them. And after that, we take that uh, cognitive function GWAS uh, that you'll see a couple, couple slides back and perform uh, TWAS, uh, Mendel randomization analysis uh, using different uh, brain and uh, other tissue uh, gene expression data to build up the functional evidence for the genes that we identified from the cognitive function uh, GWAS. So here you can see that we leverage many different EQTLs from many different tissues and from many different uh, data resources. And beyond that, we also use some uh, statistical approach called the magma gene set analysis, trying to aggregate genetic variations into genes. And then we try to uh, filter or rank the genes based on the evidence supported by all these different analysis. So we run through, so basically you can think of it as we run through a lot of analysis trying to basically integrate all the genetic association with the functional data together and come up with a filtered list of genes, which filter the genes into a 2000 genes uh, list, which is still too many. So the next step we do is that we cross check that with uh, basically a drug gene relationship database, try to prioritize the druggable genes. That is the genes that we know they are druggable uh, features or previous evidence for drug development from the database. And then we further go through a layer of uh, statistical analysis uh, that is in the middle here. That is we're trying to, uh, through the statistical approach we call a uh, Haiti test, uh, we try to exclude uh, any genes that shows up in this uh, analysis that is through linkage disequilibrium. So we want to identify uh, th the genes that's highlighted or prioritized by actually causal genetic variations. And we come down to a, a 76 high confidence genes. And we found that uh, there's 16 genes that's most likely druggable genes, uh, which actually means that those 60 genes are already uh, drug targets for drugs that's in the market but not for cognitive function, but for some other disease. So that's the repurposing part. So through that, we can potentially repurpose uh, the drugs related to these 16 genes uh, for the purpose to enhance cognitive function. So uh, I think if you compare this to any academic research, they are actually very similar. Uh, this is a type of uh, a research that in currently in human genetics field is being done a lot, but it has actual drug development implications uh, from, the, from its result. So this is uh, one way how we leverage uh, human genetics data for target uh, identification and validation. 
And here's the actual gene list. But if you're, I'm not going to dig into this, but if you're interested, please take a look at the, the paper. And finally, I also want to share a little bit about so-called biobank research. Uh, biobank resources is now uh, being leveraged very heavily by pharmaceutical companies uh, to uh, enhance the drug development process. So here I'll talk about one specific example uh, using UK Biobank to identify novel targets for cognitive function. So let me start with a little bit introduction to UK Biobank. So uh, this is specifically on the Exxon Sequencing Consortium, which is concluded a couple of years back. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies you see their logos here is because uh, this is a pharma consortium where uh, these, uh, these pharmaceutical companies all put in their money to basically whole Exxon sequence the entire UK biobank, which includes about 500,000 uh, participants. And uh, through this effort, we now have about 500,000 exons uh, in UK biobank linked to very extensive phenotyping that is as part of the foundation work uh, for the UK biobank. And of course, with this data available, what we're trying to do is to leverage these, uh, these data resources and for our drug development purpose. And one thing that uh, I want to mention as a background is that uh, it is not only now, but previous study has already shown that a rare and ultra rare coding vari variations has a pretty strong impact on cognitive function and here you can see that on the left panel, uh, it is showing an uh, exome-wide uh, protein truncating variant burden actually will impact the, the years of education. Uh, so the more protein truncating variant uh, someone carries, um, the, uh, that uh, those individuals will spend less years uh, in school, basically. And on the right panel, it also shows that uh, the exome wide burden of protein truncating variants, PDVs, will increase the risk for intellectual disability and various uh, psychiatric disorders, including autism, ADHD, schizophrenia, bipolar. And uh, there's a line of research that is basically following this early result. Now we actually have uh, intellectual disability, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar, exome sequencing studies for all these phenotypes. And here I'm going to present one study that we conducted that is focusing on the cognitive function. So what we did is that we take the UK Bobbank data and among those we have 5,000, 500,000 people with education attainment. That is basically how many years uh, someone spend in school. And we also have cognitive test results in UK Biobank, including the first one's reaction time. That is basically a digital test to see how fast someone can react uh, to the screen and uh, give the right answer to the question. So that's uh, definitely a, a cognitive function test. And that's a digital based. And we have included a third uh, cognitive function phenotype that is verbal numerical reasoning. Uh, that is basically a question-based question, question -based assessment of IQ, including uh, crystallized and uh, fluid intelligence. And But unfortunately, we have only a much smaller subset in UK Balvin that completed that test. But we use these three uh, phenotypes as measures of cognitive function in uh, adult population that's in general uh, healthy. So I'll probably just uh, skim through the analytical approach, but there are two things that I think are very important with our analysis here. One is that we did the variant annotation so that we can identify uh, the protein truncating variants and missense variants and synonymous variants actually. And in our analysis, we're focusing on the PDVs, the protein truncating variants, because we believe that will have larger impact and implicating uh, 
more relevant genes for cognitive function. And on the right side, uh, it lay out the statistical analysis. I think the most important part is that we perform two sets of analysis. One is among 320,000 unrelated uh, samples of European ancestry. And another set is close to 400,000 uh, samples with uh, European ancestry. And these two sets of analysis are actually leveraging different uh, type of types of statistical model. And we're using uh, different statistical models to uh, maximize the power to identify new genes in our analysis. So just quickly, uh, we identified eight genes uh, in this X on Y analysis. And I want to highlight just one gene, which is KDM5B, because this gene shows up as a significant association with all three cognitive function phenotypes. And what we further show is that this is uh, showing the PDV carriers uh, for uh, KDM5B gene. So what, you, what you're looking at here right now is uh, the cognitive function for the PDV carriers uh, within the KDM5B gene region. So if you look at, there's a, look at the figure, there's a blue line there and there's a red line there. The, those are the average uh, cognitive function measured by uh, the IQ test, the verbal numerical reasoning, and uh, the education attainment. You can see that no matter where the PDV occurs, on average, the PDV carriers shows lower education attainment and low, lower verbal numerical reasoning score uh, compared to the general population. I think that highlights that the impact of the PDV on the KDM5B uh, PDV carriers is regardless of where the PDV occurs within this gene. I think that's a very interesting uh, observation for KDM5B specifically. And of course, we didn't stop there. So we have additional functional follow-up through uh, mouse uh, studies. So here we actually showed that there's, uh, again, a gene dosage effect that we observe for the PDV uh, wild type to heterozygous and homozygous mutant uh, in the mouse model, where we can observe uh, significantly uh, different cognitive function and behavioral phenotypes in the mouse experiment. And finally, because we're using the biobank data, so there's actually a lot of phenotypes that we can look at in the, in the biobank. So here again, we focus on KDM5B and we actually identified additional associations between KDM5B and other uh, disease or uh, biomarker or uh, uh, intermediate or endophenotypes. So for example, we found that uh, KDM5B is also significantly associated uh, with hand grip strength, so muscle strength, and uh, with bipolar disorder uh, to our surprise. And finally, uh, like I mentioned, uh, for these uh, for these several psychiatric disorders, there's actually already exon sequencing study available. And so, what we we did here is that we compare uh, the genes and the associations that we found in our uh, exon study, which is in relation to adult cognitive cognitive function, uh, to the previous exon study on uh, developmental delay. And we can see that here, the genes that we identified that are associated uh, with co uh, adult cognitive function are also to some extent enriched uh, for developmental delay, which shows that there's uh, potentially some genetic overlap between the developmental delay that we observe in the severe, uh, in the patients with uh, severe uh, clinical outcomes uh, with the adults that basically are healthy, but have a, a level of cognitive function variation in the population. So there we make the link between the severe clinical outcome and a, a phenotype that is benign, but with variation in uh, the general population. So I think this is another very interesting finding and which give us some, uh, some confidence that the genes we identified 
in this general adult population are actually relevant to some disease phenotypes. So the two examples I'm sh sharing today ends here. I think just give a quick summary. Uh, so human genetics are now really very widely used for uh, identify and validate drug targets. And uh, the promise is that uh, human genetics uh, supported drug targets will have a higher uh, success rate for the drug development. And the GWAS and Exxon study, uh, they actually provides new insights into cognitive function in the two examples I showed today. And we also see some synergy between uh, the genes that we identified for cognitive function and with the genetic uh, components or genes that's related to neurodevelopmental uh, disorders and uh, psychiatric uh, disorders. And finally, uh, by leveraging the large-scale population biobanks, we actually have uh, uh, more resources, more opportunities to explore the genetic basis for a very wide range of complex diseases and, and traits. So I'll stop here and uh, here's my acknowledgement. This is actually a lot of collaboration with uh, the company and many uh, academic institutes that we come up with uh, these uh, interesting uh, studies and findings. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen, for your really engaging and exciting talk. It was, I'm sure the audience has a lot of questions and I also have some questions, but um, I will probably reserve that till the end of the talk. Um, for the audience, if you um, are willing to, we would like to like take a picture, like virtual picture of everyone uh, who attended the event. So if you could turn on your cameras, that'd be great. If you're not comfortable doing that, that's also okay. Um, and then before uh, we proceed with our next talk. Yeah, yeah, I see some people turning on your cameras. Uh, I'll give you like 10 more seconds. Wow, it's great to see everyone. Okay. Um, are you ready? Um, take, say cheese. One, two, three, cheese. Um, one, one more. One, two, three. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, so uh, I'm sure um, you guys are all excited with Dr. Chen's talk. We actually have another... Um, very awesome talk as well from Dr. Wan Ping Li. So as a brief introduction of Dr. Ali, she was, um, so previously um, Dr. Um, Li worked at the, uh, was undergrad at National Taiwan University, actually studying electrical engineering and uh, mostly focused on semiconductor design. And then she then moved to uh, Boston, studied at Boston College um, as, as a postdoc, who worked on software development for next generation sequencing of data analysis. Uh, she later became an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in 2020, so which is where uh, Dr. Lee currently resides. She's a assistant professor in pathology and laboratory medicine at the Perlman School of Medicine. She's also the associate director of IT at the National Institute of Aging Genetics of Alzheimer's Disease Data Storage Site and the co-chair of the Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project Structural Variant Working Group. So... Um, Dr. Lee's uh, expertise uh, includes in the development of algorithms and software that are important for genetic studies, including the 1000 Genomes Project and the Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project. Uh, she mostly expertise uh, is focused on vital understanding the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. So um, very impressive uh, background. And I was also really curious, like how Dr. Lee, like, was able to move from a uh, semiconductor electrical engineering background to studying genetics. Uh, what are, and um, so Dr. Lee can take it away. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Joanne. And uh, thank you everybody to be here with me for this uh, Friday night and uh, Saturday morning if you are in Taiwan. And uh, as Duan mentioned, uh, currently I'm serve as research assistant professor at uh, UPenn. And uh, 
it's nice to uh present my work after uh after uh Jia Yan because uh Jia Yan already give you very good background about how how uh genome uh how uh, human genetics can help for uh, disease and uh my current uh, research interest in uh, relies on the uh, neurodegenerative disease especially i will talk about two uh, neurodegenerative disease the first the one is Alzheimer's disease the second one is uh, PSP so you will see more detail about this this disease uh, later on uh, usually we will say there are at a uh, neurodegenerative disease a uh, hallmark something like a neural cell death or something like a pathological protein aggregation and uh, usually we will also uh, uh, we will also uh, I mean pay attention to those uh, important neurodegenerative disease but it's not that easy uh, to uh, for you to familiar with uh, each one. So today I will focus on the uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease. So far for the Alzheimer's disease, for the protein level, we already know there are tau and uh, uh, and a beta protein uh, we have seen in the uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease brain. And for the uh, genetic uh, factor, so far we already know uh, APP, uh, PSN1, and uh, PSN2. And uh, APOE is also quite important for the less, uh, less onset Alzheimer's disease. And another disease i like to uh, introduce is uh, PSP, uh, which is a tau plus, uh, which is a tau uh, protein disease. But usually, I think uh, before uh, for that disease, uh, we will misdiagnose it as a Parkinson. Uh, since uh, for that disease, you will see the motion issue is the uh, first uh, phenotype when we see, uh, when we uh, uh, diagnose the uh, patient. So uh, we will say that it's a uh, atopic uh, Parkinson disease. But uh, some people, we don't like to, um, we don't like to have that classification because uh, that should be a tau disease. And uh, also for the uh, genetic uh, um, uh, from point of view, uh, we can see the signal is from the uh, map T, uh, rather than those uh, genes that show significant for the uh, Parkinson's disease. So as I mentioned, there are two neurodegenerative diseases I'd like to uh, introduce today. The first one is Alzheimer's disease. The second one is uh, PSP. For the Alzheimer's disease, for the Alzheimer's brain, you will see tau and uh, uh, beta amyloid uh, aggregate in your brain especially for the uh, tau that would be the 4R four, four and 3R tau. So far, we already know uh, for the Alzheimer's disease, the most significant, I mean, for the late onset Alzheimer's disease, the most significant genetic factor is uh, APOE E4, and prevalence is quite high. It's about one in nine people age over 95, they uh they will have uh, Alzheimer's disease. So you can see in the future, this disease will be quite a burden for our uh, health uh, system. For the uh, PSP, it's uh, the same as uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you can also see the uh, pal, uh, tau protein in the brain, but the uh, label between the 4R and 3R tau, you can see for the uh, PSP, uh, almost uh, the uh, 4R tau is, uh, the level of 4R tau is uh, much higher than 3R tau. And uh, currently the uh, most significant genetic factor is uh, MACT, as I just say, I mean, uh, because uh, MACT is a very important tau gene and the uh, prevalence is very low. Uh, so uh, we say uh, PSP is a rare uh, rare disease in our uh, human disease. So here I also list uh, all, the, uh, all the protein uh, related to the disease. And uh, today we focus on this uh, Alzheimer's disease that between uh, A beta and uh, PSP, that would be the tau, tau disease. Okay, so let's uh, move up. Even both disease, uh, we can see the tau aggregate in your brain. But how, uh, I mean, um, 
the stage or the uh or uh, where or uh, where or uh, how or uh, where aggregate is quite different between uh between these uh two two diseases. So I just want to uh show you. I mean uh the above is uh Alzheimer's disease and bottom is the uh PSP uh disease. The way that uh tau aggregate is uh quite different in the uh in a different region. Yep. Okay, and uh, Jiayin already showed for the uh human genetics. Uh, we of course like to understand the uh, gene. We like to detect the mutation in the gene, and that gene may uh and that uh and that mutation may contribute to the uh disease. So so far for the uh, Alzheimer's disease, we already know there are some. A uh, very famous, uh, I mean, mutation in uh PSN one, PSN two, APP SOR one, or uh, CHAM two, or uh, ABCS seven, and as I say, I mean, uh, APOE, uh, this one is very famous for the uh for the let onset, and uh from uh from this figure you can see the uh x axis is shown in the uh, allele frequency, that meaning how often. Uh, in your population, you will see uh, this mutation. And on the y-axis is uh, talking about the uh, risk uh, increase. Oh, uh, is that the, oh, uh, oh, is that a mutation contribute as a protective uh, mutation? So uh, that is the way to look at this uh, table. And we uh, spend that of time uh, studying those very rare disease, uh, sorry, a uh, very rare uh, mutation, just because uh, we we want to understand the real uh the real uh pathway, I mean from the mutation all the way to the RNA sick, all the way to the uh, uh protein level, how uh how people we got uh how people we got uh sick from Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and now you understand, uh, I mean, uh, from the uh, phenotype uh, level, uh, also from the protein level, what you will see uh, for these two uh, diseases, then you may ask then uh, how can we detect the mutation of the patient? Usually uh, we will use a uh, genotype uh, array or uh, we can do the uh, whole genome or whole exome uh, sequence. Between these uh, two, uh, I will say for the uh, genotyping, usually the uh, genotyping is a technology uh, used to determine non-variant. For the uh, sequencing, then you are able to identify novel one in addition to the non-variant. Uh, and about the number of variant uh, you can see from these two technologies from the chip, that uh, depends on how many probes you have uh, on your chip. Otherwise, uh, you usually can uh, see a uh, variant, uh, number of variant from uh, 650,000 to 2 million. For the sequence, uh, of course, you need to go, uh, go through a long process then usually you will see about 3.5 million to 5 million uh, variant from your sequence data. For the uh, sequencing, sequencing data, you are also able to detect uh, insertion deletion short one, or you are able to detect uh, structural variant. And uh, of course, the sequencing is more expensive than uh, genotyping and application. I think both of them are able to do the uh, GWAS. And uh, for, for the uh, sequencing, you are able also to detect the novel uh, 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 mutation for, uh, for the disease. So that uh, here, I uh, just want to show you, I mean, how, uh, how can we uh, determine the uh, variant from our patient? Okay, so uh, even I say the number of the variant we detect from the uh, array is uh, much uh, fewer than 
than uh, sequencing. But after using this uh, technology called imputation, imputation is, uh, I mean, uh, you can see a uh, SNP on your prop, on your pre-designed prop on this uh, chip. And then with your database uh, comparison, then you can impute those unknown uh, SNP on your chip. So in, uh, in total, I think uh, people argue that uh, it's more than 95% of uh, variant uh, we are able to impute on the uh, genotype data. Okay, so I think uh, I just told you these two uh, neurodegenerative diseases. I, uh, I told you the, uh, I mean, the gene related to Alzheimer's disease also show you how we detect uh, variant. And here I'd like to introduce this project called uh, Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project. Uh, this project uh, initiated in the, uh, 2018. By that time, uh, they first released uh, 5,000 whole genome sequence data. Two years later, they released about 20,000 whole exome. And then uh, one year later, they released uh, 16,000 whole genome sequence data. And uh, 2022, uh, we see the uh, 36 whole genome sequence data. I think uh, this timeline got uh, uh, postponed to uh, uh, 2024. Uh, for, for this year, we uh, anticipate to see uh, about uh, 60 whole genome sequence data. Of uh for the Alzheimer's disease, the uh cohort setting would be uh have control, have uh have case. So not only for the sequencing data, this project we also have the uh, uh phenotype homologation group, and uh, we also have the uh functional functional genomic uh group. So uh we are able to combine our uh, multi omics together to study. Uh, Alzheimer's disease. So the reason why uh, National uh, Agent Institute like to uh, start this uh, ADSP project, Alzheimer's disease uh, sequencing project, because uh, we want to identify the new gene for uh, ADRD study, and uh, we also want to identify the potential, uh, potential uh, therapeutic uh, approach uh, I mean, uh, in the future for the uh, uh drug uh, discovery and uh yeah so uh I think uh another key point uh currently inside NIA is that uh for all the project we want to study disease in the um multiple uh, race multiple ethnicity categories so uh I think uh those are the goal uh, of uh setting this project. Okay, now I like to uh, show you uh, my analysis uh, using the data from uh, from this uh, from this uh, ADSP project. I am using the uh, R three seventeen k seventeen k data. So uh, here are two uh, preprint uh, paper. You can find it on a uh, Mac archive. As I say, the uh, NIA currently quite emphasize for all the study we need to consider multi-ethnicity. So from the uh, R3, we have non-Hispanic Y, we have Hispanic, we also have uh, African American. And uh, for the uh, AD status, uh, you will see about 50% of them are AD cases, 51% are AD control, and 9% are unknown. Actually, this 9%, most of them are uh, PSP. And uh, if you combine these two information together, you can see for the Hispanic and Africa America, we all have more control than cases. That is quite normal in the uh, US because that easier to uh, collect control and harder to collect uh, cases, especially for the uh, minority. And for the non-Hispanic Y, it's uh, much easier to collect uh, all the samples. So for the non-Hispanic Y, from this uh, ADSPR3, we have more cases than control. 
So that is the setting of this data. And uh, we have the whole genome sequence of, uh, uh, of this uh, 17K sample. So I do the uh, first, uh, I, of course, I uh, went through the standard uh, whole genome sequence uh, processing pipeline, and then I apply uh, uh, GWAS uh, study uh, to analyze this uh, data. And uh, I pull all the sample together. I also separate uh, sample into three major uh, major ethnicity, which is uh, Africa, America, Hispanic, and non-Hispanic. Why? The reason why I pull everything together because I try to increase the sample size, and I also try to understand is there any common uh, impact across all the population. And the reason why I break uh, ethnicity down into a small cohort because I try to see is there any specific uh, uh, impact for that uh, specific uh, population. So uh, non-Hispanic, why? Because uh, I have uh, more data, so I can see, I mean, additional uh, signal from a CR1 and BIN1. For the Hispanic, uh, this uh, one on the uh, chromosome 14, that is a signal for the uh, early onset that is quite close in the uh, p one region. Okay, so uh, E4 and E2 as a risk and protective factor for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So when we break them uh, down into the, uh, I mean, uh, population level. We try to study, is there any significant difference uh, between uh, different uh, population? So you can see, it seems uh, E4, uh, allele frequency for the cases and control is not that uh, different. So meaning uh, E4, at least in our data set, is not, uh, I mean, seems not a major player for the uh, Hispanic uh, group. Of course, I think uh, E4 is still quite significant. If you go back to see this Manhattan plot, you can see uh, Apple E, E4, and E2 still quite significant for Africa, America, and uh, non Hispanic white, but not for uh, Hispanic. And uh, I also show you, I mean, uh, uh, you are not surprised. I mean, uh, our knowledge of uh, E4 and E2. Uh, majority they are from the uh, European ancestry uh, study. So uh, I also show you, I mean, uh, the uh, the allele frequency we see here is quite close to the uh, UK biobank. But if uh, if you compare with uh, our data in Taiwan, Taiwan Biobank, you can see the allele frequency, it, uh, I mean, slightly different. That, uh, that will imply maybe the uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease uh, genetic factor in other population. Maybe uh, we, uh, we have other signal rather than these two famous uh, signal. Okay, so then the uh, bottom uh, bottom panel I like to show you is that for the cases you are not surprised uh, we will see more homozygous uh, E four aggregate on this uh, on this uh, cases uh, 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 category and uh, and yeah I think that that probably the uh, information I just want to show you yep. Okay, so let's uh let's move on. As I say, for the uh, Hispanic group, uh we see there is a signal on chromosome fourteen, and that is the signal for the early onset, early onset uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we also uh I mean uh we also indicate the uh I mean the cause of that uh that uh signal is from this uh is from this mutation called G2O6A. If you are a G2O6A carrier, then uh, you may about, I think, uh, 20 years uh, younger than others to have uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease. So uh, this one is quite interesting. And uh, this uh, G2O6A only happen in Puerto Rican population. 
from uh from our analysis, we didn't see other population they carry this uh, G206A mutation. And now you may ask if we do the uh, local ancestry analysis, can we identify where this uh, region is uh, inherited uh, from? So uh, from our local ancestry analysis, uh, we see this uh, region, local region, may be inherited from the uh, African uh, genome. And uh, remember, for the uh, Puerto Rican population, more than 70% of their genome is uh, from European. But for this region specifically, it's from African American. Okay, and uh, from the previous uh, presentation, you also heard uh, Jia Yan mention that uh, colocalized uh, analysis. The way I do colocalized analysis, it's uh, between uh, SNP and uh, structural variant. So the story here is that uh, because uh, when we uh, because we increase the sample size, so we see this new uh, gene mutation uh, gene is called uh, NCK2. We see there is a SNP inside intron region of uh, NCK2 as a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. But uh, when we do a uh, structural variant analysis, because uh, my uh, my study is on whole genome sequence data, so I can do the structural variant work. When we uh, check the uh, structural variant uh, structural variant analysis, we find out uh, there is a deletion uh, upstream of the, uh, I mean of the NCK two gene, but located in the promoter of NCK two. So now we are thinking maybe the true signal is from this uh, structural variant rather than this two SNP in the uh, intron region. But of course, we need to do more uh, functional uh, study on, uh, on this uh, variant and to confirm the true signal is from a structural variant. Okay, so and uh, another structural variant uh, analysis is that uh, I like to highlight uh, this uh, gene called uh, RAB uh, gap. Rep gap one, there is a 98 best pair uh, duplication inside this uh, gene. And where is located? Sorry, I forget. Maybe maybe in the intron as well. Then uh, it shows us a protective. And uh, when we cross check with the uh, RNA uh, sick data to see the gene expression uh, information, we see control because uh this one this duplication is as a protective factor we see for our control if you are control and you are also this mutation carrier then uh you can see i mean uh you will have a significantly uh lower lower uh uh lower emeroid uh, uh beta label that is quite interesting and uh if you are as Hamas patient and you are carrier, sorry, uh, you are carrier or uh, you are non-carrier, let's say you are non-carrier, then uh then uh you are uh then uh, we can see your uh, memory score is lower uh we think because uh because then you don't have this uh duplication as a protective factor. So uh, your memory score, then uh, you will uh, uh, lose your uh, memory faster than, uh, than uh, you are carrier. So uh, that is what we think about this uh, duplication. And that is from our uh, structural variant analysis. Okay, and uh, the same, I mean, similar approach I apply on the uh, PSP uh, whole genome sequence data, and uh, there are two uh two pre 
preprint uh, paper. Again, you can find it on Mac Archive. And uh, there is also another uh, story uh, right down by the uh, else, uh, forum. So uh, you can also uh, find, uh, find out uh, our story on the uh, forum. Uh, overview of our uh, data set and result is uh, here. All the sample here is uh European uh European sample because uh, we don't have other other ancestors tree sample and uh we have about close to uh four thousand sample in total uh we have our uh, uh, one seven one eight cases and uh I mean uh, quite impressive here is that uh almost uh, everybody we try to autopsy confirm they are they are a PSP patient and we also have uh, I mean uh, around about 3,000 control from ADSP data and the uh, Manhattan Pride is uh, showing here as I said MAPT we already know MAPT is important for the uh, tau, tau, uh, tau disease and uh, we also see the uh, APOE here but differently from Alzheimer's disease. If you remember, oh, sorry. If you remember, I say E4 in the Alzheimer's disease, it's a risk and E2 is protective. But for the PSP study, the impact is our opposite. The E4 become uh, protective in PSP and E2 become risk for uh, PSP. Again, this may be a bias from our uh, sample selection, but uh, I think uh, in these 10 years, people uh, slowly figure out, I mean, uh, from other data set, they slowly to figure out E2 somehow really a risk uh, for the uh, PSP, which is a protective factor for Alzheimer's uh, disease. So we don't know, I mean, uh, what is the uh, mechanism behind, uh, behind this uh, finding, why uh, the risk in uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease will become protective and uh, protective in Alzheimer's disease will become risk in uh, PSP. Okay. And uh, not only for the not only for the uh, SNP and uh, short insertion deletion analysis, we also try to understand the uh, structural form inside this uh, important uh, important gene, important region H one H two for uh, tau disease. So uh, we try to understand the three uh, copy number variant, which is alpha, beta, gamma. Or try to understand if uh, we have more copy, then will we uh, uh, increase the risk to have a PSP uh, disease. And from our data, uh, we find that uh, gamma independently contribute to, uh, to the uh, PSP. If you have one more copy, then, uh, then you may increase uh, 1.10 uh, for the uh, PSP uh, risk. Okay, so I think uh, I would like to uh, summarize my uh, my presentation, saying that uh, for the uh, for the both uh, neurodegenerative uh, disease, we develop a pipeline for uh, conducting association analysis on whole genome sequence data for a uh, SNP for short insertion deletion, also for the copy number variation and structural variant. And uh, for the uh, PSP, interestingly, we find that uh, E2, which is a protective factor for Alzheimer's disease, now it is a risk factor for uh, PSP. And uh, also we find that a uh, copy number of a uh, gamma inside uh, H1, H2 region, inside the uh, MAPT region, uh, contribute to the uh, contribute the PSP uh, risk independently. But uh, uh, we really like to have more sample 
for uh to confirm our uh, finding also a uh, more sample from other and sentence tree that uh, we can cross check there is no other uh no other population or oh, there are some uh, other uh, population specific uh, genetic uh, impact for the uh, PSP. So I will stop here and I'll try to uh, thank you to Posta in my lab. Also my collaborator from uh, UCLA for, for the uh, PSP uh, work. And uh, this uh, data set is uh, collected by uh, tons of uh, cooperators. So you can see here, if you are interested in these, uh, these uh, two neurodegenerative uh, disease, of course, you should also apply the data on the uh, ADSP website. So I will stop here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for an also extremely exciting and interesting talk. Um, so now the floor is open for the audience to ask any questions. Um, if you want to ask questions, we uh, ask that you can like turn on your microphone and probably your camera as well. Um, and you can directly ask the speakers or you can also uh, paste your questions in the chat and I can ask them for you. Um, so maybe I can start with a question from the audience. I think this is actually for uh, Dr. Chen. So the question is, um, so this is actually a pretty specific question. Since KDM5B adds um, this uh, histone lysine methyl-3 at CBG island around the promoters, do you see any epigenetic disorder as well? That's a that's actually a very good question. So, uh, mm -hmm. in our own study, we didn't see it. Uh, it's because a lot of the diseases that's related to uh, community modifiers are uh, early onset severe uh, developmental disorders. Uh, UK Biobank is a population biobank that collects uh, data from volunteers uh, uh, in adults. So we don't actually have, uh, we didn't identify any any patients of this kind of disorder in UK Biobank. But I think from the literature, we know that it's it's uh, it's closely re related, just that we don't observe it in our data. Yeah, wonderful. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, I do have a question. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I have a question uh, to um, Jiayan. So yeah, thank you Jiayan to provide a very comprehensive analysis. And I'm curious about, uh, you, you You mentioned about you, uh, there is several method to do the target identification. Uh, so like collocation and T was and like EQTL based method. So uh, I'm wondering like which method or what type of method you feel like is more, can provide more like promising uh, result. That's that's a very good question. Thank you. So, uh, I think instead of directly answer your question like which method is the best, uh, I think it's more of a conceptual. Uh, uh, I'll give a more conceptual answers to answer to that, because for drug development, every target we follow up uh, requires a huge amount of resources. So instead of trying to do comprehensive scan and try to characterize all the genes that we identify from our analysis, uh, the idea is more about trying to prioritize the genes that we identify through our analysis. So in the end, depending on how large or small your company is, essentially, or your lab is, you may be able to follow up with one or two or three or five genes. So the way I see these different methods and different data is actually that we'll try to run the analysis as much as possible and as many different methods as possible. But in the end, we use them together to actually not trying to find as many targets as possible, but as few targets as possible. We want our money to be put on the most promising target. 
So we see it as a filtering. If you go back to the paper I mentioned previously, it's like a filtering process that we go from 20,000 to 16. That, that's the goal for our application in the pharmaceutical. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> um, we have a audience like Rick, um, you can ask a question. Yes, so uh, my, my question is, as we know, uh, Alzheimer's disease, I mean, the question would be bo for both of you. So Alzheimer's disease definitely is polygenic. So uh, the later, I, I assume, I mean, it's not assume, I mean, the paper mentioned this, I mean, the, the longer the people live, actually the oxidative, you know, uh, stress from the microglia because of the aging actually will causing more damage on the on the uh, neurons or the brain's uh, chromosome and make some uh, FMV as well. So the the older uh, you will probably will get some uh, different gene being targeted or you know I mean uh, that will be also could be the target as well. I'm just wondering when you are talking about a filtering and uh, how. I'm just like a big picture is what exactly the, the, the good way, I mean, for most of the polygenic disease. I, I, I understand the polygenic because when we call, uh, when we name Alzheimer's disease, is people only focus on, on the name, doesn't really focus on actually the damage is in a, cert, a certain circuit. Right, so that's more important. Basically, it's cognitive functions being damaged. So everything relate in that circuit it doesn't matter which gene, whatever. Just for example, like trim 2 is the Rick's gene, but actually microglia is everywhere in the brain. So, but we still see trim 2 become a more important, uh, play an important role in there. So I'm, I just want to get a big picture of the idea about what do you think about the, when, when we do the drug development or drug discovery, how could we be filter the most important and the early detection for a certain gene that actually can help us to, to target the most important. For example, um, I think target TRIM2 may be a little bit too late uh, because I think it's more like it's, uh, it's during that time, probably the neurodegeneration has happened for a long time. So I'm just wondering, is it possible there's a way uh, we can do the early detection and also can find a druggable target earlier? Anyone want to take a stab at the question? Oh, have, so uh, have, yeah. so uh, my question. So I, I say it again. So what uh, what do you think about how can we do the early detection and also find the target actually can be earlier, not waiting for two, waiting for the people is getting too much older and at a certain point the neurodegeneration is. It's very uh, severe, and uh, you even you give the drug that's not helping because it's reached the point of no return. So, so Sorry, look, go for it. I, I can, I can, I can say first, but but uh, I would just want to make sure I say that upfront that it's, it's because Biogen specifically has pipelines in Alzheimer's disease, so I I will not talk about anything specific to what we're doing in the company. I'm just going to talk about in general my idea about your question on early detection and what's more what's the more viable drug target. I think early detection. Um, there's a lot of discussion on uh, telepathy and uh, biomarker. I want to specifically talk about biomarker because I think that is a way for early detection. We move from a uh, PET scan to CSF biomarker, to now plasma biomarker, if you follow, I'm sure you probably do. Recent papers, there's now a plasma tau or plasma A beta showing as biomarkers for, for uh, Alzheimer's. I think that's actually a very important step forward with early detection. And it's, it has also very significant impact on clinical development. And I want to say also significant impact on human genetics. If you check recent publications, there's start to emerging relatively small, but it's emerging. GWAS for tau, GWAS for NFL. So those biomarkers, we have GWAS now, which means that we can then in turn leverage those data in the approach that I, I shared with everyone earlier. 
that is actually one, I think, important aspect of how we can use the biomarker that may be representing some type of risk prediction or early detection, but also in identifying the more relevant gene target for, for, for target identification. I think the link is potentially there. Those biomarker data are actually extremely important. If I have the money, I will bet on a large data set for a GWAS on, on uh, the biomarkers, more accessible biomarkers for, for, for AD. I think that will be immensely helpful. So I think um, for my point of view, that that is really a very tough question about the drug target for the uh for the let's say uh polygenetic risk uh I mean a uh, risk uh disease. Uh that is also the reason why even an IA spends so many money for Alzheimer's disease, but uh, we still don't have any any good target and CHAMP2, as you say, uh, we we know that probably too late. And uh, there are also, uh, I mean, some other signal from uh, GWAS, BING1, CR1, and it seems they are also not good target. And uh, APOE, uh, we try, but we don't have a very, uh, I mean, good approach as a uh, drug uh, discovery. Also, uh, if that APOE uh, impact for the PSP is different from Alzheimer's disease, that that also means uh, that really not a good good way to, uh, I mean, um, uh, study your drug on that gene. So overall, I think that that is tough. And uh, for, the, for the academia, I will say, uh, Jia Yang already mentioned, I think now uh, all the research uh, direction we move to the uh, biomarker, uh, that is a very hot topic in uh, in these uh, recent two years. And uh, for example, for the uh, PSP, uh, before, before uh, first the time we see the phenotype of that patient, that patient may already have a tall lesion for more than 10 years. So then, yeah, so then uh, we hope, I mean, uh, maybe we, 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 we can have some approach uh, between these 10 years window, we can see this patient that may, that may be a very, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, high risk of PSP patient. But then people will argue even so, because we don't have any uh, uh, treatment, even we know that beforehand, what can we do? So you can see early diagnosis is one thing, but early diagnosis also need to plus with, uh, is there any treatment or not? If, if not, then early diagnosis still cannot uh, help, uh, help us to uh, cure this, uh, this disease. But I will say, I mean, we don't uh so far we probably don't have a very good good approach for uh for the neurodegenerative uh disease. Yeah. Thank you for your answers. Um I think due to time we have just probably uh, openly one more question from the audience. If you have any questions. Okay, I can ask one last question, uh, kind of like a concluding. Um, so you we're talking about like early diagnosis of the disease or looking at genetic risk factors of disease either through um, Alzheimer's disease, um, PSP or um, cognitive um, function. Um, so what are your thoughts on like the increasing um, amount of people doing genetic tests like 23andMe, um, either through genotyping or should we get our sequence, our gene sequenced? Um, and how do you uh, analyze the data? Do you have to analyze it in... Um, ethnicity specific way. So I uh, taking into account like we're Asians or African Americans or Hispanic or Caucasians. And like as you've shown, like the same risk factor can carry different meaning across different ethnicities. Um and what do you think for the broader public? Um is there anything we can do, say we know we have an Apple E4 um potential risk factor. Um it 
is that, does it inform any clinical decision or is there anything you can do about it or it's just going to stress you out and you'd rather not know? I uh I do twenty three and me for my for myself. Then uh mm -hmm. I don't have uh e four e four. I I'm e three e three, so it should be fine for Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> then you say people should we should we do that? I will say I mean that depends on how you are curious about about your uh, genome because the result is quite vague. Uh, I think there are just some very uh, I mean, very significant association we uh we already know, and twenty three and me will uh will give you report. And besides that, I think uh others I will say maybe 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 not that important. But again, I I will say I mean for the uh you point out uh multi ethnic mm -hmm. uh, study, I know current uh recently. I know uh, there are several people in Taiwan, they are E4, E4, and their age is, uh, I mean, uh, older than uh, 70, but they still fine. So that made me think maybe, I mean, for the uh, Asian, mm -hmm. for the uh, Taiwanese, we just have a different mechanism that uh, we, haven't, we haven't figured it out. Hmm. That's a great answer. Thank you so much. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, um, like to conclude today's seminar on the role of human genetics and understanding cognitive function in neurodegenerative diseases, I'd like to thank both speakers for your wonderful talks, um, and your insightful presentation and contribution contributions to the discussion. I've covered a lot of topics today, um, from uh, GWAS to Alzheimer's disease to cognitive diseases, um, and then drug discovery. Um, I also like to thank everyone who joined this uh, panel or this, uh, and contributed to questions. And then um, also like to thank the uh, BTBA members for helping to coordinate this event. Um, thank everyone for attending. And uh, as a reminder, we will uh, not immediately, but we will upload this um, to our website um, the, to allow you to uh, visit, revisit this talk if you happen to miss part of it. Um, we look forward to seeing you at our next event. We actually have uh, another event in April. We also have um, our big event uh, in August. So uh, really hope you can see you there. And um, so I'd like to say good night to people in the United States, in Boston, and then uh, good morning to people who are in Taiwan or on a, in the morning time zone. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending today. Um, signing off. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye.